was pretty upbeat. I like want to dance now or something after that. Thank you, worship band, for such a great worship set. That was awesome. So good to be with you this morning at Harvest. Again, my name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here. If you're watching online, I'm so glad that you're with us. Feel free to participate in the chat room as this service goes on. We are kicking off a new series today. And as I saw people come in the room, I'm, I almost can tell who the introverts are because I saw some people start breathing sighs of relief because all the chairs are facing forward. If you were here our past three weeks, we had a dialogue series where we were making everybody talk to each other. So it was real uncomfortable for some people, introverts like me. So if you're, if you're happy that we're all facing forward, that you don't have to talk to each other, it's okay. We're, we're back to our regularly scheduled programming. You don't have to talk to anybody. It's fine. So thank you so much for being here. We're starting this series called Fact Check. And in this series, we're looking at commonly, commonly used sayings and phrases that get thrown out there in our culture and in our wider world, and we're kind of putting them on, under the microscope a little bit. Because if we're not careful, familiarity can start to feel a lot like truth, right? And so this, this is a way for us to try to examine some of the things that maybe we hear, maybe that we've said ourselves, and see, you know, how does that line up? How does that square up? So in light of this being our fact check series, I thought it would be cool to start off with some, a little game of true or false. Does there, did anyone else like true or false questions when they were in school? I mean, I love these things because you had like a 50% chance of getting it right. Those are pretty good odds. You could have no clue what the question is about. You might get it right. And so in light of this being fact check, I'm going to throw some, some statements up. And if you think it's true, I'm forcing you to participate, by the way. If you think it's true, I want you to raise your hand if you think the statement's true. If you think it's false, keep your hand down. And if you're on the online campus, tell us in the chat room if you think these statements are true or false. So are you guys ready to play? Here we go. Our first statement. A frog will stay in a pot of water until it boils if you raise the temperature gradually. Raise your hand if you think it's true. Keep it down if you don't think it's true. All right, we got a lot of, we got a lot of hands. This is a pretty, like, 75, 80% of folks say that this is true. All right. Are you guys ready for the answer? That's false. It's actually false. That frog's getting out of the pot of water. It doesn't matter if it's gradual. It doesn't matter if it's already boiling. That frog is getting out. If there's a lid on it, it doesn't matter, Michael McAllister. <laughs> so it doesn't change. It's going to try and get out. So you may have heard this, right? It's this commonly used proverb to talk about. If you're not paying attention to gradual change that may happen around you, it could end up hurting you or destroying you, right? But it's, it's not literally true. And do you know, like, who discovered this? There are some old scientists back in the 1800s who was trying to research the existence of the soul. And apparently one way that you do that is by boiling frogs. If you get the connection, please tell me, because I sure don't. Now, that, was, that one was false. We may have heard it a lot, but it was actually false. What about this one? True or false? Hair and fingernails keep growing even after a person dies. You're afraid to answer now? Okay. Okay, we got a few hands. People are a little more unsure right now. We got some hands. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say this one's about 50-50. All right. So ready for the answer for this one. This one is actually false as well. Sorry to keep throwing you for a loop. But actually, it takes nutrients to make your hair keep growing, your fingernails keep growing. What appears to be growth after your death is actually your flesh wasting away. So you're welcome for that mental picture, by the way. So that's actually false, too. And here's our last one, our last statement. True or false? Just like with fingerprints, every human being has a unique tongue print. True or false? What do you all think? You think it has to be true? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I could throw you for a loop here. I'd say we're down to like 30% now. I think I've scared everyone from saying true. This one is actually true. Yes, I threw a loop for you, Maya. You're welcome. So just like this is just how we're all unique snowflakes in the snowstorm of life, right? We have unique thumbprints, fingerprints. We also have a unique tongue print. And I'm really grateful that the police don't, like, make us ink up our tongues and, like, eh, try to put it on a piece of paper to try to ID people because that would be really nasty, right? So these, these, these are kind of common statements. Some of, them, uh, some of them are actually uncommon. But I'm grateful that Google allows me to research some commonly believed myths and some uncommon facts. Thank you, Google. But the more important lesson that we're able to learn from this is just because you hear something like a frog being boiled in a pot of water, if you raise it gradually, 
Just because you may have heard something like that all your life doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, right? And in the same way, in this series, we're looking at phrases like, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter. We're looking at phrases like, everything happens for a reason, right? Phrases like, you know, it's okay as long as nobody else gets hurt. These things that maybe we've heard, maybe we've said, maybe we've told ourselves. We're putting them under the microscope because we're interested in learning the truth. The truth of how God has revealed himself in scripture, what he desires for our lives. Because we know that if we learn the truth and if we live according to the truth, there is freedom in truth. And Jesus, when he's talking to these Jewish people who are believing in him in John chapter 8, he actually is very challenging to them. But he says, if you trust me, if you follow me and obey my commands, then you will be my disciples. And then he says this in verse 32, and then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's more than just a mental exercise, right, about collecting knowledge in your head when Jesus is talking about that. It's about the rubber meeting the road. It's about applying this stuff to your life. And when we do that, when we live into the truth, we discover there's immense freedom. Freedom not to do whatever the heck we want, but freedom from sin, freedom from evil, and all the things that seek to destroy us and others, and we can live the life that God intends for us to live. That's the theme, really, for this series. And like Tom mentioned earlier, we're going to talk about a topic that can be really uncomfortable. We're going to talk about sin this morning. Now, it can be easy. I know some of us may have had experiences where some pastor gets up and they get really riled up and they just start yelling at people about sin and all that sort of stuff. That's not my goal this morning, right? And whenever we talk about sin, it can be very uncomfortable. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, sometimes that's okay. Sometimes it's okay to feel uncomfortable. And I just encourage you to track with me in this as we go through this together. Because I feel it too, right? So let's go together as we talk about, about sin this morning. So the first thing that I want to talk about when I talk about sin is that it, the definition of it means that we are missing the mark. That's what the Greek word for sin means. It's like you're a marksman, like you're an archer, you're aiming at a target, and you completely miss. You don't get where you were intending to go. You don't reach the goal that you sought out after. You miss the mark. And we read in Genesis chapter 3 that sin has a lot of effects on us as people and on those around us. When you read about the fall of humanity in Genesis chapter 3, it's wonderful because it, it really demonstrates what sin does. I mean, it leads to self-betrayal. The man and the woman, Adam and Eve in the garden, they, they betray themselves and what God told them to do. And they listen to the serpent. And then there's this powerful sense of shame that falls over them. So it damages us personally whenever we sin. There's the shame. There's the sense I need to hide. I need to cover up myself. But it also damages our relationship with God. In that same narrative, God comes looking for them in the garden. He says, where are you? Who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from the fruit of that tree, the knowledge of good, of evil, good and evil? And then God curses them. And there's struggle. There's frustration. There's some brokenness in our relationship with God whenever we sin, right? But also there's brokenness in our interpersonal relationships because Adam tries to throw Eve under the bus. This woman that you gave me, she's the one that made me eat it. And then Eve throws the serpent under the bus. Well, the serpent's the one that told me to do it. And there's brokenness in our relationships with others, right, that sin can cause. And it doesn't even stop there. There can be brokenness that happens to the creation around us when we sin. That, it, that there are thorns that grow up in the ground now, that we have to work by the sweat of our brow. And as Paul says in Romans 8, that all of creation is longing for redemption. It's not just humans that God cares about. It's the animals. It's this earth as well. All of creation longs for God's redemption, for the revealing of the children of God. It's not just about humans. It's about what we do on this earth as well that matters. Sin breaks and damages on so many different levels. That's what it does. It's a nasty thing. And I literally could have gone a hundred different directions with this sermon, right? There are a lot of misconceptions out there when it comes to sin. Now, I just want to talk briefly about a few, and then we're going to drill down into one. The first that I think we've heard before, and maybe we've said ourselves, is I'm not a bad person. And really, I think this gets at what is the ultimate standard by which people are going to be judged? What is the measurement that measures a good life or a bad life? 
And I think for a lot of us, we get by on being generally good. We're not as bad as some of the other people. Maybe we haven't royally screwed up. Maybe we have. But we feel like we do some good things. We, we do some of the do's. We don't some of the don'ts. And we're generally moral people, right? But that's not the standard that God lays out in Scripture. In fact, Paul says that every person has sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God, a perfect God that we serve. Nobody's perfect. Anybody here perfect? If so, please come preach this sermon, because you do a lot better job than I would. None of us are perfect. We all fall short. And what we're judged by is not if we've done enough of the do's and don't, didn't do enough of the don'ts, but we're judged by if we have that relationship with Jesus, that friendship with Jesus, trusting in him to do for us what we can't do for ourselves delivering us from sin and all those things that seek to hurt us and undo us. And also we trust in him to be Lord of our life, that he calls the shots. That's what faith is. We're judged by how much did we live in faith and trust with Jesus, not being average or generally better than someone around us, right? That's the biblical story that we live in. Another one is that Christians don't sin. Now, once we become Christians, it's like, okay, I finished this sin thing. I'll never do it again. I haven't sinned in 15 years or something like that. If you meet anyone that says that, run away from them as fast as you can because they're lying, right? I mean, all of us still struggle. There's not a soul on this earth that I've met or know except for Jesus who never sinned and who still doesn't struggle with some way with sin. And if we set the standard of perfection up for ourselves, like, okay, I've got this one chance to be perfect before God, and if I screw up, I can never show my face in church again. I, I've failed God. God doesn't want anything to do with me. If we set that up as our standard, we've got a pretty miserable life we're going to live, right? How much more reasonable is the expectation that we should strive to be all that we can be in Jesus Christ, but realize that somewhere along the way we're going to stumble, right? And that we make mistakes. And when that happens, God's grace is right there with us. That he forgives us if we come to him, if we turn from that stuff, if we, by his grace, pick ourselves back up and keep going and try to make things right. That's a much more forgiving and graceful attitude toward ourselves, I think, as we move forward. Don't try to make yourself be perfect. You'll mess it up every time. There's also the misconception that sin is the best kind of fun. All of these Christians are a bunch of stodgy people. They're joyless. All they do is they get together in places like this and talk about how bad it is out there, and they're just concerned about themselves and what they can get for themselves and feeling holier than thou. And it's a joyless kind of existence that they live. There's that conception out there, right? And that sin is the best kind of fun, that God's just out there to take away your joy, to, to make you stop doing all those things that are really fun. But sin actually is fun at a price, it's going after something good like pleasure, something good like power, which can be used to help other people. But it's twisting it, right? It's going about it in the wrong way so that it's fun at somebody else's expense, so that we feel like we betrayed ourselves, so that we feel like we threw somebody else under the bus to try and get that power. Sin is getting something and hurting someone in the process. It twists our conception of what is good. And it leads to damage in ourselves and in others. How much better to have the pure joy that comes from laughing with friends, knowing that you're not throwing anybody else out, that you're not hurting anybody else, but the pure laughter that comes from hanging out with friends and just having a good time and not feeling guilty about it afterward. That's the kind of joy that God wants us to live into. It's not bad if it doesn't hurt other people. This is actually another sermon in this series. So that's a little teaser. I'm not going to talk about that. Keep your, keep your ears open. Keep posted on it if you want to see that sermon that's coming later on. It's not bad if everybody's doing it. I mean, everybody's greedy. If you look around, everybody boasts about themselves. No one's humble. Everybody sleeps around. Everybody in my neighborhood, they've got a $100,000 car. Everybody keeps getting bigger and bigger houses. Everybody's focused all on themselves. I mean, everybody's doing it. So, I mean, it's not bad if everyone's doing it, right? That's not the case. Just because everybody does something doesn't make it right or make it true. Jesus says that narrow is the way that leads to life, but broad is the way that leads to destruction. Just because everybody does something doesn't necessarily mean that it's helpful or that it's good. And lastly, it could be easy for someone like me, a pastor, to stand up here from a platform like this and pretend that I've got it all together, right? 
to criticize some sins and say, that's the problem with our world. Those sins are bad. We need to look at those and talk bad about those and then completely ignore that I'm in this too, that I'm a selfish person, that sometimes I like to twist the knife or I like to, to pull the strings whenever I get into an argument with my wife, Laura, right? Or that, I, or that I like to do things where I'm selfish with my time and I'm not available for others like I should be. When I do things like make all these promises and commitments where I'm going to get up and I'm going to run and I'm going to exercise and I'm going to have this commitment where I'm going to really produce and I'm going to be good and, and, you know, do all these things that are awesome and then I sleep in the next morning, right? All these good intentions that never seem to materialize. Hey, I struggle too. I'm not there yet. And I hope this doesn't come across as someone who's yelling at you, who's throwing it at your face, who's not in the same boat as all of us this morning, as we have stuff that we deal with. See, Jesus doesn't want us to be hypocritical. He says, pull the log out of your own eye if you're going to criticize the speck in someone else's eye. Do it from a place of integrity and seeking to help someone and to love someone, not to feel holier than thou or just to display how much you feel better than another person. There's so many misconceptions about sin out there. We could keep going on and on, but I want to drill down this morning with this phrase. It doesn't matter what I do. Now, nobody believes this at face value. If you're a person of no faith, if you're a person of any world religion, any background pretty much, unless you're a psychopath, you have a moral code, right? You do some things because they help others, that they're good and beneficial, and you believe that some things are bad. Everybody pretty much has a moral code and believe that it matters what they do. But we can start to slip into this subtle thinking where I think we actually believe this very thing, especially as Christians. You know, we can start rationalizing away our sins. We say, you know, God, I give, I, I volunteer, you know, I pray in the mornings. So this argument that I'm having with my spouse where I'm to being a total jerk right now, you know, I bet God doesn't really care about that. He just looks at the good stuff that I do. So I'm going to sweep that under the rug because these good things are the important things. And we start to explain away or rationalize away some of the things that we do that aren't good. Or even worse, we start to use God's grace as a crutch as a license to do the very things that God doesn't like. We say, uh, you know, I'm going to get trashed this weekend, but I'll ask God for forgiveness. He'll forgive me later. You know, and doesn't that make God look good? Because it shows how merciful God is, how gracious God is. And, and that, isn't that what we're about, spreading about, spreading the news of God's grace in our lives? And so I can do whatever I want. And it makes God to be out, out to be this grand enabler in the sky, right? This enabling sort of parent who says, do this, do that. It doesn't matter what you do. I can forgive you of anything. Forgiveness here, forgiveness there. No expectations. What kind of parenting style is that, right? I mean, if you raised your kid like that, they're going to be crazy. They're going to have no expectations. They're not going to have any sort of character developed in them. But I think we can develop in those sorts of ways. We can think that kind of way, and we misunderstand the purpose of God's grace. And when I say grace, I'm talking about undeserved, unmerited goodness that God gives us. It's always action, action that God does on our behalf. But I think that we look at the forgiveness aspect of that, and we don't look at the transformation aspect of God's grace enough. Because you see, God's grace isn't just something, some nice forgiveness that comes and polishes the chains that bind me. But grace is also power power of the Spirit of God to break those habits, those hang-ups, those hurts, those things that we do that we wonder why we do them, that frustrate us. God's grace is not just forgiveness. It's power. Power to live a different life. Power to have the character of God in us. The purpose of God's grace is that we would be holy, which means that we are different. We are distinct. We are a peculiar people who reflect the character of God in our world who look and smell and act like Jesus and look a little bit like the fruit of the Spirit, right? Which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the life that God wants us to have. And while He always meets us where we are, He's not going to be satisfied if we are apathetic to going all the way. He's not going to be satisfied if we try to rationalize away some of our sins because he wants us to grow up, to deal with some of those things. And it's in my life too. He wants me to grow up too and to be all that I can be for Jesus. 
You know, the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter to the Roman church. And in it, he takes this idea of God's grace being a crutch and a license to sin and do whatever the heck we want. He takes it head on. He uses a rhetorical device back then. It, it's an argument, an arguing technique. It's a writing technique called diatribe. And it's where you think about your opponent, like your opponent's listening to me speak right now, and they'd say, well, Stephen, what about this? Did you think about this? And they challenge me on something that I say. And Paul uses it. He uses his imaginary opponents and what they would say to try and deeply, more deeply illustrate the truth that he's trying to get across. And so Romans chapter 6 starts off with a diatribe, a question that Paul asks. Because he ends chapter 5 saying, where, gr where sin increased, grace increased all the more, right? But then he says, well, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Shall we use grace like a crutch while we make God look great by just how much he can forgive us? Paul says, by no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He goes on to say that when we are baptized into Christ in a mystical way, we participate in his death and his resurrection, and we relate to God and to people in a new way when we are baptized. And he comes on further, and skipping down to verses 6 and 7, he says this, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Paul makes sin, he personifies it. He makes us this monster that's looking around, that seeks to dominate people, coerce people, take control of their lives, make them do the things that they don't want to do. That's how he views sin in the book of Romans. And he says that when we come to Christ, and we are baptized into Christ, we are set free. That sin is no longer our master, that it can't tell us what to do anymore, that we have a newfound freedom in God, and we don't have to listen to that voice. It can't call the shots for us anymore. But, but we do the still sin, right? I mean, am I the only one that still sins? I'm, I'm just going to be honest here. I, okay, so I've been following Jesus for a while. But what about at 10 o'clock at night when I've had a stressful day and then I know that I'm supposed to be eating healthy, but then I find myself rummaging through a bag of chips or breaking out the ice cream, emotionally eating, stress eating to try and deal with my stuff, right? What is that? And I mean, I say that I'm going to go run in the morning, and I have all these good intentions, but why is it that sometimes I just don't seem to do them? I mean, isn't sin not my master anymore? I mean, I'm, I'm living the Christian life. I'm with Jesus, but why does this still happen to me? And why do we find ourselves with some of these habits and hang-ups coming back again and again? I mean, was Paul just kind of blowing soft soap here? Was he out of his mind when he was talking about this stuff? I think there's more to the story. Especially as Paul continues on in verses 11 through 14, he has this to say. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. It's a mindset sort of thing. Even more than what we feel or those habits that we have, we think of ourselves in the way of that Christ has redeemed us, that we are free. But then he goes on to say something very interesting. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. So sin's not our master anymore, and yet it still has this influence, right? It still calls to us, and we can still invite it back into our heart to have a stronghold in this very place that Jesus liberated, that he set us free, and yet we can invite sin to come right back in and to be master over us yet again. It's kind of like our hearts are a house. And Jesus comes, and he comes to clean up our house. He comes to clean up the living room, and it was really trashy, messy, and he does all this work, and now it looks great. He goes to the kitchen. It was a disaster, and now it's spotless. And yet we still have this room that's locked upstairs, right? This room that we don't want to let Jesus into in our house. So we, we like for people to see the kitchen. We like for people to see the living room, these places that are more presentable now that Jesus has dealt with in our lives, and yet we've got this closet upstairs where we've put some more junk, some nasty stuff, some stuff we want nobody to know about, we don't want anybody to see, and we don't want Jesus to come into that room of our house. We have these pockets, these strongholds where we still want to keep control. We don't want to offer them 
to Jesus. And Paul says further, and offer every part of yourself to him, not just some parts, every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. We find ourselves with these dueling desires inside of us, especially those of us who follow Christ. We want to please God, and yet sometimes sin is right there with us, challenging us, tempting us to do what we know is wrong. So how do we, as people who follow Jesus, break the power of sin? And I'd offer three things briefly here. The first way is confession. The second way is spiritual disciplines. The third way is accountability. And let's talk about confession a little bit. Confession is where we are no longer content to keep that room that we've locked up, to keep it in the dark, to keep it a secret. But we're willing to bring it into the light that we might find healing from God and freedom from that, that sort of thing that drives us down. You know, James chapter 5 talks about it in this way. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We're no longer operating out of this woundedness, out of this secrecy. There's something very freeing, very healing that comes, not just from confessing it to God, but actually telling it to another person, a person who's trustworthy, someone who will pray for us, who will encourage us and say, God forgives you of that, and I forgive you of that, and you don't have to live that way any longer. That can be a very freeing moment, but we have to find someone that we can bring it to the light with. You know, our Roman Catholic sisters and brothers, they're really good about this. They actually require that it happens at least once a year. And I think, you know, some of us chafe at mandated spirituality, you know, but, but I think there's some wisdom to that, to regularly going in and, and confessing what really is going on in your heart to someone that cares, to someone that will pray for you, to someone that will forgive you. But it doesn't stop there. Because we can talk about forgiveness, we can talk about confession and being honest and vulnerable and authentic in that way, but if it stops there, it's incomplete. We can find freedom in confession, but we need to replace what we left behind, those things that we're seeking to cast out of us with something else. And I'd say spiritual disciplines is a great way to get spiritually charged up, to get strength to face whatever comes your way throughout the week. And all of us, the pastors talk in pretty much every sermon about a spiritual discipline all the time. I mean, we can't talk about this stuff enough. It's scripture. I mean, it's good to know right and wrong and what's sin and what's not in the Bible. I mean, we need to read that sort of stuff to know ourselves and to meditate on scripture and let God speak to us in scripture. There's worship. There's prayer. There's serving in the name of Jesus. There's fasting. There's more that we could list here. All of these are ways that we get charged up that we spend time in the presence of Jesus and we're not running on empty, we're not taken as much by surprise whenever those temptations come our way. But rather, we have the strength to stand, to show some fortitude, to choose differently. Because often when we get taken by surprise, when we're on empty, it's very easy to react and to be automatic almost. How often do we get spiritually charged up for our week? How much is that is a commitment and a priority for us. And lastly, I would say accountability is a great thing, great way to grow. This can come from a spouse. This can come from a, a friend, from a coach, from a counselor, a mentor, all of these. Someone who's trustworthy and who will sharpen you. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. I mean, who tells you the truth in your life? Because we all have people who are going to encourage us, who will support us, who will pat us on the back, who will give us that, that thing that we need. We need that encouragement. But who's going to tell you when you have spinach in your teeth, right? Who's going to be honest with us and challenge us so that we can grow? We need those kinds of friends in our lives because they help us be all that God desires for us to be. In all of this, I just want to reiterate that the purpose of God's grace, it's not just forgiveness, but it's holiness. It's transformation for our personal lives. 
It's not a cheap grace where we use God to get whatever the heck we want, and we're still the ones who are in control and in, con- in charge, but rather it's surrendering ourselves to God. So as we think about this this morning, is there a sin in our lives, in my life, that the Holy Spirit is bringing up for me to work on? And if there is at this moment, what is that? And what's a step that we can take to deal with that? Maybe, maybe I'm struggling with greed or with lust, or maybe I'm proud, whatever it might be. Think through those things and think about what's a step that I could take to try to deal with that, to not operate out of that woundedness, but to live in the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. And who can I encourage to pursue holiness? Who can I be that good friend to? Who can I tell the truth to with the intent of loving and helping, not with trying to be better than them or holier than them? You know, I, I think crosswinds could be a place known, not just for acceptance and forgiveness, but actual transformation. What would it be like if people started to take notice in our community that these people, they love us where we are, and yet they continue to grow, they continue to progress, they seem to be willing to grapple with hard things to grow and to be more and to be better for Jesus? What if we were known as a place of transformation? What kind of impact would that have in our community, in our families, in our friendships, if we were a transformed people who are growing in God's holiness ourselves? And I know a sermon like this can feel like it takes all the wind out of your sails. It can be very personal sometimes. And again, I'd say sometimes it's okay to be uncomfortable. I feel it too. But what will we do with it? Will we take it and move forward with it? Or will we just let it pass us by and neglect an opportunity to go deeper into the love, into the joy, into those fruits that I talked about? The choice could be ours. I want to ask Tom to come up. He's going to play some.